Can you all hear me? No. Do you all need a stretch or you're all okay to carry on? Okay, so um, my name's John Fleetham. Um, I work with Fernanda at UBC. Um, my official title is I'm Head of Sleep Disorders for Vancouver Coastal and I'm one of the organizers for this meeting and one of the things we wanted to do with this meeting is have a public forum like this in terms of patient awareness and so that you could come and hear about the, the spectrum in terms of sleep disorders and, and ask some questions. So um, my presentation is going to be relatively brief. I'm going to tell you uh, a little bit about sleep apnea. So the, it's interesting. You've been hearing about the, uh, the treatment prior to discussion in terms of the diagnosis, but that's what I'm going to do. Um, also, I have no slides. We were told to do a sort of a TED-like talk with me marching around the stage and everything like that. So I didn't bring any slides. Um, so my, my topic is sleep apnea diagnosis and treatment. Um, and the first thing is to say it's very common. Um, it affects one in 10 people, so one in 10 of you have sleep apnea. Uh, and if you have diabetes, if you have uh, high blood pressure or something like that, then one in two of you have it. So it's really very common. It's as common as diabetes, is as common as high blood pressure. A and slowly we're uh, educating physicians so they're aware of it. In fact, as you get older, uh, the three things that you, you develop are high blood pressure, diabetes, and sleep apnea. Um, uh, the next thing to say is there are different types of sleep apnea. They're not all the same. Um, uh, there are five different types. Um, the one which Dr. Almeida has been talking about is obstructive sleep apnea. And that's when you can't breathe. So when you fall asleep, you relax all your muscles, your arms, your legs, but also you've got a whole series of muscles at the back of your throat. When you relax those, the noise that you make is the noise of snoring. And then if the tongue falls all the way back, uh, you cut off the breathing. And so people go through a cycle of falling asleep, snoring, uh, the tongue falling back, stopping breathing, and then waking up. And then falling back off to sleep, stopping breathing, and then waking up. And if you want to know the model of that, it's a bit like me sitting in a chair next to you with a pillow and waiting until you fall asleep and then I put a pillow on your face uh, and then you stop breathing. And then the smart thing to do if you're not breathing is actually wake up and tell them to take the, the pillow off the face and so you suddenly wake up and then as soon as you fall back off to sleep, I put the pillow on. And it's not uncommon for us to see people stop breathing for a minute or two and they will go through this cycle five or six hundred times a night. So it's a bit like the phone ringing all through the night. So that's obstructive sleep apnea. Um, another form is central sleep apnea. So central sleep apnea is when you forget to breathe. Um, you know, uh, in the brain you have a pacemaker and that, that pacemaker says breathe, breathe, breathe. And then in some people that's wrong. In some neurological conditions, uh, we now see, you hear a lot in the press about people on opiates uh, for a variety of different reasons. Uh, 80% of people on opiates will stop breathing because uh, opiates depress your breathing. And then there's a special form of um, uh, sleep apnea called chain stroke breathing, a special form of central sleep apnea. And that's very, very common in people with heart failure, very, very common in people with dementia, uh, neurological disease and everything like that. So those are the two major types in terms of sleep apnea. And it's important in terms of a diagnosis of coming to the correct diagnosis. There are other forms where people develop it when they're started on CPAP treatment. There are other things, another form that actually, if you're morbidly overweight, that you will develop. Um, so different types of sleep apnea. Um, now, I came to BC in 1981. Um, at that time, actually, nobody had sleep apnea, and now it seems everybody has sleep apnea. Um, but actually, we've known about sleep apnea for a long time. Um, if you read Shakespeare, Shakespeare, it, it seems that authors were better observers than doctors. Doctors like diseases that happen Monday to Friday, nine to five, but uh, authors like Shakespeare. So Shakespeare described Falstaff. If you look back and look at Falstaff, Falstaff clearly had sleep apnea. Um, Dickens, uh, if you read Pickwick Papers, there's a guy called Joe Boy who was always falling asleep. And then as a father, I used to read my kids um, Jack and the Beanstalk, and I always remember that story, but actually uh, the giant um, who had acromegaly, which is very common for sleep apnea, fell asleep. And then Jack um, escaped as the giant fell, as uh, fell asleep because of his sleep apnea. So, you know, uh, I don't know who wrote Jack and the Beanstalk, but it's there historically. Um, how do you know whether you've got sleep apnea? 
Well, snoring is one of the symptoms of obstructive sleep apnea. So some people don't snore at all. Uh, my wife tells me I snore now and again. Some people are really noisy snorers. Uh, the guy I go playing golf with is one of those. And you know, you can't share a room with and everything like that. And snoring is, you know, the, if you just snore and it's now and again, it's nothing to worry about it. But if you snore and it rattles the, the windows, you know, it may be a symptom of more significant sleep apnea. Uh, as I say, it's, it's a matter of um, sleeping overnight and, and it's, <coughs> You know, you will wake up many times during the night. So when you wake up in the morning, you feel unrefreshed. And then the, the, one of the parabelt symptoms is, is daytime sleepiness. And so uh, I work at UBC. I go in many faculty meetings. Some of those I'd love to fall asleep in. But, but falling asleep can sometimes be a problem. Um, I see judges that fall asleep um, during trials, and that, that's expensive because they're mistrials. I've seen anesthetists um, lose their privileges because they're falling asleep during operations, and clearly that's an issue. And a real concern, and a real concern in terms of this field, is people who fall asleep while driving their car. And I would say every clinic I have, I have two or three people sit in a chair and say, I fall asleep uh, while driving. And, and the motor vehicle branch in BC is now very aware of that and has specific guidelines in terms of that. So some people have no symptoms. Some people come in usually with their wife, and the wife says he stops breathing during the night. It's not always the wife, but it's, this is a male predominant disease. <clears throat> and, and sometimes the patients, uh, you know, it's sleep de deprivation, so they don't feel good during the daytime. Uh, they can't concentrate. They're a bit snarly and everything like that. Um, who gets it? Um, well, many years ago, we thought when the, we started to hear about sleep apnea, we thought it was just men. And we thought it was just overweight men. And if you want one predictor that we look at, my kids used to watch television and say, that's one for you, Dad. It's neck circumference. So men, as, the, as you put on weight, put on weight around your abdomen, but also around your neck. As it gets bigger around the neck, it gets smaller in size. And so neck circumference is a big predictor of that. In fact, years ago, I wrote to Marks and Spencers, which is an English company which sells lots of shirts, and they sent me a, a bar graph of the, the, the number of size shirts that they sold around the world. And we even joked about, you know, if you pull out a size 17 shirt, uh, perhaps it should have a little warning label in terms of uh, you may have sleep apnea. So you, you don't have to be overweight to have sleep apnea, but it certainly helps. And, and then it's a male predominant disease, uh, but like most male dominated research, we started to figure out that women have sleep apnea. Um, and women tend to present with different symptoms. They tend to have more psychological symptoms. Um, women tend not to have sleep apnea until the age of the menopause. And then after the menopause, they're more, more likely to do it because there's a change in the structure of their upper airway. And then we thought, well, um, you know, we thought it was fat men, and then it was thin men, and then it was women. Um, and then children also have it. Um, in BC, we have a children's sleep apnea uh, or sleep laboratory at, uh, there. And children present in a different way. Usually, it's the first child, and the child goes to school, and the teacher says, why is he always asleep? It can present with bedwetting. It can develop with failure to thrive. Um, it can present with learning disabilities. And, and certain children, um, uh, uh, the parents of uh, children with Down syndrome, um, Down syndrome has about an 80% prevalence in terms of sleep apnea. So uh, parents of Down's children are very aware of this. So it can occur in many different people. Um, what are the consequences? The, well, the consequences are the symptoms which I've just described. And I have to say, I'm a, I'm a respirologist, I'm a lung doctor. I treat lung cancer, I treat COPD, I treat lung fibrosis, uh, but I treat sleep apnea. And if you treat sleep apnea, people will come back and say, I feel a thousand percent better, or doc, that's a game changer. And you know, as a physician, that's very rewarding. Um, it doesn't happen all the time, but you know, sometimes it's a bit like getting glasses. Uh, when you first get glasses, you, you can't actually you weren't aware of what you weren't seeing. And actually, if you're treated for sleep apnea and you suddenly wake up and you're rested, um, then that's a great feeling. And, and people will use the treatment, such as an oral appliance or a, a CPAP machine, because they feel better with it. And they, if they stop using it, uh, they don't feel as good. Um, 
the other thing is I spent I suppose the last 30 years um, and you see a meeting like this and lo there's lots of research going into what is the evidence what's the downside of having sleep apnea and we now know that sleep apnea causes high blood pressure it causes diabetes if you have diabetes and you have sleep apnea you're more likely to develop the complications from it um, cardiologists know you're more likely to have cardiac arrhythmia, so a very common disease that people get in their 50s and 60s, something called atrial fibrillation. And it's now thought that um, if you have atrial fibrillation, you should be screened for sleep apnea. Um, it's a cause of heart disease, uh, heart attacks and strokes. Um, Interesting, I gave a round in terms of um, to the ophthalmologist in town. So if you have sleep apnea, you're more likely to have glaucoma and uh, ophthalmologists are, are aware of it. If you have sleep apnea, you're more likely to have um, complications during surgery. And so if you go and see an anaesthetist and everything like that prior to surgery, uh, they will be concerned about it because if you have sleep apnea, it's untreated, um, you're more likely to have complications. And then something which has evolved in the last five years, it's interesting if you Google um, cancer and hypoxemia, which is your oxygen going down, you'll come up with three or 4,000 hits in terms of everything. And there's increasing evidence that if you have sleep apnea, you're more likely in terms of developing cancer. So um, what should you do if you think you have sleep apnea? Well, it, you do exactly the same as you do with any other condition. You go to your family doctor. And most family doctors are now more aware in terms of this condition. So you describe your symptoms and if they're fairly mild, if it's a little bit of snoring and everything like that, then you know, they know how to deal with it. You, know, you should lose weight, cut back on the alcohol, sleep on your side. But if they think you're more likely to have it, if you have a comorbidity such as heart disease or high blood pressure or diabetes or something like that, if you're overweight, uh, have a big neck circumference, then you need some sort of a sleep apnea or sleep test. And, and there are two ways in terms of doing it, okay? One of which is to go um, to a sleep laboratory, uh, sleep clinics, and there are in the province now about 18 accredited by the government uh, sleep laboratories and you sleep overnight there. It's an art, you know, you're wired for sound and all sorts of things. Um, it's a detailed study and it's very accurate, only it's in a rather artificial situation. The other thing, if you're high probability, if your symptoms are classic, um, then you can have a home study. A and home studies are freely available, funded by the government uh, in accredited places. Be very careful um, in terms of now, because CPAP is not funded in this province, there are a whole bunch of um, CPAP companies who are promoting free testing. Um, this testing is not funded by the government, it's not MSP funded, it's funded by the sales of CPAP machines. So you've got to be very, very careful because there's a bit of a conflict of interest there in terms of they want to help you, but they also want to sell you a machine. And as you've heard, there are other treatments in terms of sleep apnea. It's important to get an accurate diagnosis because we see many people <coughs> who've been diagnosed incorrectly. They may have other causes. So there are other causes of sleepiness. There's a condition called narcolepsy, which occurs quite often in young people. Um, there are different types. You cannot treat central sleep apnea with oral appliances or a CPAP machine. So it's important to have an accurate diagnosis. It's also um, being diagnosed or being misdiagnosed has implications. It has implications in terms of life insurance. It has implications in terms of driving. So when you go and get your driver's license uh, renewed, they say any problems with your health. Um, and then when you're 80, you actually have to go and they do a full medical. If you say you've got sleep apnea, then they bells will go off and they will say, well, um, how severe is this? And, and, and so patients in this province uh, with sleep apnea or a certain severity are unable to drive and, unless it's treated. So it's something else to be careful of. And the government is concerned about, or the motor vehicle branch is concerned about that, is because of the high numbers of people who have untreated sleep apnea who are falling asleep at the wheel. Um, the other issue is in terms of extended health benefits. So CPAP and oral appliances are not funded in BC, 
but they are funded for certain groups. So if, you are, if you're on social assistance, uh, if you're indigenous, um, if you have extended health benefits, they will pay for it, but only of a certain severity. So finally, um, is uh, what do you do in terms of treatment? So the fundamentals of treatment are losing weight, exercise. Um, you know, have a drink in the evening uh, is nice, uh, but actually alcohol makes you fall asleep, but actually screws up your sleep and makes it more likely to have sleep apnea. So quite often we will see people and they only have sleep apnea for the first couple of hours. And it's usually because they've drunk a bit and everything like that. So, you know, if you're going to drink, in my world, it's better you drink at eight o'clock in the morning than eight o'clock in the evening. But, uh, you know, it's, it's best to avoid alcohol in, in general. Then the treatment, uh, so I'm old enough, the treatment we used to do was tracheostomy. So tracheostomy used to drill a hole in the back of the throat and put in a tracheostomy. It was a, a radical thing to do. And then in 1981, um, CPAP was introduced. Uh, and CPAP was introduced by an Australian. He used to come to this meeting. And basically, he came up with the idea. He was doing a physiological experiment. And his idea was to blow air in through somebody's nose just to see the physiology of the thing. And it was a man uh, who was going to have a tracheostomy the next day. And the man woke up and he said, I don't want a tracheostomy. I want one of those machines. And, and what CPAP is, it, it's a machine that blows air in through the nose. And it's like inflating. Uh, a, a bicycle, the inner tube of a bicycle tire. So it's good that it, 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 it irrespective of where the, the obstruction is, whether it's in the nose, the back of the throat, or lower down, it works. Um, and CPAP now is a major industry. Uh, I think they sell like um, five million a year uh, around the world and everything like that. So certainly in BC now there are 40, 45 companies selling it. They, you will see them sort of advertising many different places and everything like that. And, um, and CPAP now is heavily marketed in the internet, um, in the second hand market and everything like that. So CPAP has been a major advance. Um, it's correct for people who've got the right disease. Um, the good thing about CPAP is you can try it. And if you feel better with it, you'll be motivated. It's a unique treatment to a physician in that um, it's the only treatment actually that we can monitor. So the CPAP actually will generate information about whether it's working and whether you're using it. Uh, and actually in certain places, uh, then you can have a central monitoring thing. It almost sounds like the CIA. And if you didn't use your CPAP machine last night, you get a phone call saying what problems were you having. It, it's kind of unique in terms of that. When we give a patient a pill, we've no idea whether they're taking it. But if we give you a CPAP machine, actually, we can check whether you're using it. And, and, and so it's quite unique in that. Um, if you're going to get a CPAP machine, spend the money on the mask. Uh, a lot of work has been made on the mask and everything. Um, and, and then they come in different forms in terms of CPAP machines. Um, but basically, they're all a reverse vacuum cleaner. They're just blowing in air through the nose and everything. Um, CPAP works for some people, but not for everybody. Um, and if people give it, a lot of people just don't like the concept of dressing up like Darth Vader every night. Um, as you get older, that tends to bother you less and everything like that. And, and actually, quite often, wives, and it's usually wives, again, are very supportive because you know, their husbands are more rested, uh, more productive, uh, less noisy at night and everything like that. And so, but CPAP isn't for everybody. Um, you've had a great talk from Dr. Almeida. I, I've known Dr. Almeida for many years. If you want an oral appliance, um, she is the best person. She's an international star in this field and everything like that. And oral appliances are an effective treatment um, for people with uh, sleep apnea. The only thing about it is you can try a CPAP machine out and, and then give it back. Um, the thing about an oral appliance is you've got to have it fitted, made, uh, and there's some cost involved, and so you can't just try it out. Um, there used to be surgery for it, but I would be very, very cautious. Uh, those of you who lived in Vancouver, uh, there were lots of places along Broadway. You can go and have your laser, your uvula lasered out and everything like that, and it was very attractive surgery to cure things. But in general, surgery is, is not a good idea and sometimes can make your sleep apnea worse. 
the holy grail um, is finding a medication um, to treat for sleep apnea. And um, one of the great things in meetings like this is we all share ideas. Um, I was a couple of hours ago actually listening to somebody and there's, there's a, a study which came out this year in terms of two medications which are available to treat CPAP. Um, there are two medications which are available, but they're not approved in terms of sleep apnea yet, so stay tuned. I think uh, we may have mu more exciting treatments for sleep apnea, which we'll avoid. So the man at the back is already saving five minutes, and uh, uh, I'd like to leave some time for you to ask questions, because this is, you know, you've been sitting here, some of you, all day, and uh, the major thing is actually to, for you to answer, ask some questions. So I'll stop now. But please ask some questions. It might be best to go to the microphone um, if you've got questions and everybody can hear them. Sir. I was wondering whether if, if you have the uh, symptoms, the night si nighttime symptoms, you know, but you're, you don't really feel sleepy during the day, then how likely is it that you still have sleep apnea and might have the bad consequences in terms of the cardiovascular disease or cancer? You've asked a very good question. And so I've said one in 10 of you have sleep apnea. And it's like everybody has the symptoms that I've just described. And if I sit in a clinic and I see people walk through the door, I will see a spectrum of people. Some people will come in being restless and waking up through all through the night. And sometimes they get treated for insomnia. Some people come in because they're very sleepy all the time. And there are some people who come in usually dragged in by their wives and they say, I don't know why I'm here. And the wife says, well, because you've stopped breathing. And so some people don't have any symptoms. And so the buzz terms in terms of medicine are precision medicine, personalized medicine, phenotyping. And it seems there are these different characteristics and, and the risks may be different and, and the response to treatment is going to be different. It's, it's much tougher to give a CPAP to somebody who's asymptomatic and then say, trust me, wear this for the next 20 years and you might not have a heart attack, okay? It's much easier. So you know, one of my standard lines is I'm paid by you, the taxpayers, to do two things, make you feel better and make you live longer, okay? Um, I'm sort of more into making people feel better because that's very immediate. And when a doctor says, take this pill or use this machine, uh, and you're going to live longer, yeah, I think it's appropriate to say, how good is the evidence? You know, do I really have to use this for the next um, 20 years and how much longer will I live? Um, perhaps, I mean, as I said, I'm a respirologist. There's a great film called Quartet, uh, and in that there's a guy called Billy Connolly, and they're trying to convince him to s stop smoking. You know, and he says, how, long, how much longer will I live if I stop smoking? You know, will it be a week and it probably will rain all that week and everything like that? So if the, if the justification is you've got to live longer, you know, just ask that, um, ask that question. It's, it's a, it's, I'm more into making people feel better. Perhaps if you can use the mic, um, that would be good so others can hear. <clears throat> We continue to talk about the same patient. What is the mandatory reporting to Ministry of Transportation in terms of driving in, uh, in BC? In, the case in BC, like if you have an apnea hypotonia index of greater than 20, you are not permitted to drive unless in you're Toronto, treated. In Ontario, it's 22, so very similar. Uh, you know, what, is, what is really the rationale for that? Because you know, those patients don't have, uh, if the airport is normal, in MSLT or MWT is normal, do you see rationale in this kind of regulation? No, you're very correct, okay? Um, unfortunately, I've been in this field rather a long time and written lots of papers, and actually, if you call them up and you ask what's the justification of that, they quote the Vancouver criteria, which was actually uh, a paper was published about five years ago from everything like that. It, it is, you cannot predict who's gonna fall asleep, and you cannot predict based on um, a number, um, but, but administrators like number, okay? So health insurance want a number, um, you know, um, motor vehicle branch want a number. I, I don't agree with that, I didn't set it, but that's what it is. But it's worth saying, um, you know, 
people with sleep apnea have four times as many accidents, and they tend to be worse accidents because they tend to be head-on accidents. And, and so there is concern about this field. And, and hopefully, you know, the system will mature. So it's, it, 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 you know, that's what it is in BC. Um, there are a couple of people at the microscope, and if, I mean, sorry, the microphone, if you want to go back. Okay. Um, yes, I mean, it's it, so, you know, if you're a doctor, there's a book. Um, and so if I had a seizure disorder, okay, um, you're not supposed to drive, okay? Um, if you have a defibrillator, there are rules about that. So there's, you know, there are rules to drive, there are rules to fly, um, which physicians are supposed to be knowledge about, okay? And so that, I'm just coming back to the point, it's important to make a correct diagnosis. And, you know, if you, you know, a lot of, a lot of I'm sorry to come back to the companies, but a lot of them are saying, you've got sleep apnea, you need a CPAP machine. And then, and then if you're misdiagnosed, and, and it's happened to a variety of my patients, then they go at 80, and they, they have to fill out the form. And I've mentioned sleep apnea, then they quite often get a letter from the motor vehicle branch saying they can no longer drive. So. Uh, you know, a diagnosis has implications. So, For a patient uh, with obstructive sleep apnea, especially more severe obstructive sleep apnea, uh, what does the recovery process look like um, after they're being treated? Uh, how long does it take? Um, and is there anything in addition to the, the, the CPAP that can be done in nutrition and exercise? Anything? Yeah, so losing weight, um, you know, cutting back on alcohol, in terms of response, quite often it's immediate. So quite often people will actually use a CPAP and like the patient I described who had the, um, had the procedure, uh, the CPAP actually felt dramatically better the next day. And it, they have a funny phenomenon in terms of they haven't dreamt for years and suddenly that night they will dream a lot. And so it, it can be immediate. There's a guy at the back going like this and so I better stop uh, if you have questions, I'm happy to meet you outside and uh, answer all your questions. Thank you.